Welcome to our third episode of our second season of the Six M's of Manufacturing podcast. I'm your host, Adrienne Temple. The labor market remains highly competitive and it's becoming increasingly difficult for manufacturers to find employees to fill open positions. Experienced manufacturing workers are in short supply, so where will the next wave of new hires come from? In this episode, we talk with Elba Lazardi, Site Director for BASF in Seneca, South Carolina, to learn more about how they are building their own talent pipeline using the apprenticeship model. Check it out. So Elba, I just want to welcome you to the show and thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Yeah, so um, BASF, I think, um, you know, We kind of talked about this before, but BASF means a lot of things to different people, but you guys are located at the Seneca facility, correct? Yeah, Seneca in um, Oconee County, upstate South Carolina. Um, So we have been here, the site has been here since about 1986. We purchased it in 2006 um, as part of an acquisition. Um, So we do recycling and refining of precious metals. That is the primary job that we do here. So we are bringing in spent materials, mostly spent auto catalysts. Um, so a lot of those materials are going to our facility in Spartanburg, where the autocallus are being decanned and, and ground up and milled, and then they come here for processing. Um, we have several processes they go through before they become pure precious metal again. So some high temperature pro- processes, some molten metal processes, and then into a chemical um, refining process and the output being that pure platinum, palladium, and rhodium. Um, and actually, from then, we use that those materials to make new precious metal chemicals. Um, so in some cases, we're making new solutions that actually go to our facility in Huntsville, Alabama, to make new catalysts for cars. So we have that full cycle going on there. Um, in other cases, we're sending into other um, industries, whether automotive, um, pharmaceutical, et cetera. Um, and then we also provide some of those materials to another business that is located here in Seneca for BASF as well. Um, And they make other types of catalysts with the precious metal and with base metals. So a lot going on under one roof, I would say, here in Seneca. Yeah, no kidding. I was about to say, that's really, I mean, it sounds like highly technical processes as well. When you start talking about those types of activities with different precious metals, that's uh, that's very unique. Yes. Yeah. It it brings a lot of challenges every single day. (laughs) (laughs) No shortage of that, right? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Well, one of the things that... um, really makes you guys unique. And, and I've seen a lot on, you know, LinkedIn and, you know, between BASF promoting it, I've seen you recognized a lot on social media, um, you know, the Seneca facility specifically, and I think at a larger scale, maybe, maybe other, you know, sites in, in BASF, but you guys kind of decided to do something a little unique with apprenticeship programs. And I really wanted to touch on that, kind of understand maybe, you know, sort of the genesis of it, like maybe, First of all, how did you guys get to a point where you're like, we need to do something different? We need an apprenticeship program. I mean, where where did that really spring from? Where did the idea come from? And then we can kind of talk a little bit about, about how you even built it. Yeah, so we're kind of lucky in that they were trying to do this at other sites as well and had actually um, been doing it at one of our facilities in Texas. I think the organization as a whole, so BSF kind of recognized that this was an opportunity of this may be another path in for manufacturing workers. So they kind of were looking for pilot facilities. So they reached out to me in the fall of 2020, kind of presented the program of this is what it looks like. This is how we think it's gonna work. Are you interested? And at that time we were absolutely struggling to hire um, and to find sufficient people to fill our openings. Um, But specifically we were only taking people who had manufacturing experience. So the whole point of the apprentice program was to open that up to people without manufacturing experience because they would learn that through the apprenticeship. Um, So to be honest, when when I shared it here at the site with a few of my leadership team, we all jumped on it immediately, um, not knowing if it was going to be successful, but certainly willing to try. Um, It took us about a year to get it kicked off because really what we had was here's a curriculum. What, how are you going to do it, right? So we had to engage. We engaged here locally um, with Tri-County Technical College. We engaged with Apprenticeship Carolina for some funding um, and really had to build it from the ground up. So while we had this curriculum, it was from a completely different site. Um, we had, um, there was nothing like this at Tri-County. So they actually worked with us to develop the curriculum. We hired a retired engineer um, from Duke Energy, which is the local um, nuclear power plant. So it's someone who they were aware of who was willing to come back and teach the class. So the way the apprenticeship program works is they go to school, 
one day a week for a year um, and the rest of the days they're working. Um, so it's a full-time job. So whether they're eight hours on the job or they're eight hours in the classroom, they're still being paid full-time. Um, they do get one dollar less than the other employees until they finish their, their graduation, so to speak, from the apprenticeship program. And then they're at that same level. Um, so it is, you know, has been interesting. The best thing I think I can say is that it has attracted what we were looking for, which is people who we would not normally have hired. Um, and so it really has done that. We had an impact in that we were also looking for some additional diversity, and we have had that as well, um, whether women or African-American mostly. Um, so it kind of hit a lot of different, um, you know, hit a, a lot of different like pluses, so to speak. Um, the other thing I will say, though, is it's not the same program anymore. We're on cohort four at this point. Three and four are going simultaneously. Three will be done in two weeks, actually. And four started a couple months ago. Um, and it's changed. Every version has been different. So we're also using continuous improvement and feedback from our apprentices to make it better for the next group of apprentices. So that's also been a, a plus that we never expected, that these guys are engaged in hey, don't you think you should do this differently for the next group? Like, it'd be nice if we had done this. It had been nice if we'd done that. And that has helped us so that each class becomes even better prepared to join us full time because their predecessors have provided the feedback to make it better. Um, and that's been cool to watch too. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, through the kind of the initial phase when you guys built everything out and kind of got it set up to this fourth cohort, have you seen kind of it it scaling up in terms of the number of people participating? I mean, has it been, you know, growing or have you, did you start with a core group of people, a core head count, and each time those cohorts were always full from, from the jump? Yeah, actually, no. So we've always said that it should be 15. We've never hit 15. We've actually never hit 10. Um, we usually, we start, we will start if we have a minimum of about five. Our classes have probably been seven to eight each time. Um, and that's been okay, right? Because I'll mm -hmm. be honest, personally, I'm not sure 15 is the right number, you know, and, and we've never had 15, but when I walk in and I try to stop in to see them, whether planned or unplanned, because we do a lot of activities at Tri-County, so sometimes I'm just sneaking into their class. Um, it's good. It's a good number because they're small enough that certainly I can learn all the names, learn a little bit of the background, but also they create a team. So they are, since they are a cohort, even though they work in different parts of the plant when, during the week, that one day a week, they're always together. So they create a relationship where they're supporting each other, where they're helping each other through the professional and the personal. We've had some people go through difficult personal times and their cohort is there to support them. Um, and I think if it got to be 15, that would be harder to do. Um, so we've kind of maintained that average. It doesn't mean we're not still targeting the 15, but we've never been um, disappointed with the size. So the size has stayed about the same. I would say um, we moved this past year was, um, the first year that we ran two at the same time. So the, the first two cohorts started initially by themselves. Halfway through the second cohort, we started cohort three, halfway through the third cohort, we started cohort four. So, and the reason for that is we also wanted to target different groups of people. So for example, this was the first year we started a group in the middle of the year, hopefully attracting some high school grads to join. So recent high school grads, and we did a huge push in the last year of getting into all the local schools, mostly Oconee and Pickens County. That's something we couldn't really do in 20, 2020 and 2021 because of COVID. But really now that we could physically go in the schools, we had somebody from the organization go in, try to go to different career fairs as well, and, and really talk about, hey, we have this apprenticeship program. If you don't want to go to college, come join us and, you know, and, and do this. And, and you actually get a certificate from Tri-County that they can use elsewhere. It's not just for BASF. Um, so I think that, you know, that has been a significant push for us as well. Of Let's make sure we're attracting different people from different walks of life. But a high school grad really wants to start working in the summer, not next January, right? So, you know, doing two cohorts at once has been a difference for us. Um, our, like I said, our, our group that started cohort three will finish in the next couple of weeks. Um, cohort five is scheduled to start beginning or end of January. So we're still continuing with our two cohorts a year and we will continue as long as we can manage that and, and have the, the available jobs for them as well. So that's interesting. I mean, the, the high school, I think it's, it's great because I've been having a lot of conversations lately about, you know, visibility of manufacturing directly at the school system and letting them know about the opportunities that are available. But I am curious, 
how, like, what does that recruitment effort look like at a broader scale? Because there's the student population that might be leaving high school and they don't want to pursue college at that time. Um, but there's also a lot of other employable people that tend to be kind of the, the hidden workforce, right? Like you mm -hmm. said, I mean, there's lots of different people that are really willing to work, but maybe don't have the background in manufacturing to start. How, how are you recruiting people to this program? You, know, you have something really good in place. How do you get the, the folks to it in, in the pipeline to participate? Right. So we're probably doing everything that everyone else is doing. I mean, we're doing Indeed. We have billboards. We have, um, what do you call it, radio ads. Um, you know, to be honest, our own employees. So we have a, a stay at home mom that was the wife of one of our employees. You know, one day he stopped me in the hall. He's like, could my wife be an apprentice? And I'm like, yeah, you know, <laughs> um, it, in other cases. So for example, even our own hiring practices. So we do still direct hire into the site um, for those who are, who do have experience. And sometimes somebody gets through into an interview who doesn't have any experience. So they'll say, hey, you're not eligible for this, but let me push you into the apprentice um, and go interview there with the apprentice program. Um, so it's also that, I mean, so that's been good. Um, we do have a lot of um, ex-military, so people coming out, whether they only did four years and they're out or they did 20 years and they're out and they're looking for that next career. Um, so one that I spoke to yesterday um, was a medic in the military. He didn't wanna do that anymore. So thought he would do something different. So he's joined us. Um, interestingly enough, he did join our emergency response team. So I'm like, well, you're still doing a little of that medic work. <laughs> um, but I thought, you know, that's another, so I think it's, it's just, we're, we're advertising just like anyone else, right? We're not doing anything special there, but we do say, Hey, it's our apprentice program, no experience required. Right. And I think that's the key because that allows anyone to say, well, could I do that? I um, mean, you know, in one of our last cohorts, cohort two, we had a woman who had, you know, mid-career, um, older kids are out of the house. Um, she'd been working in office her whole life and was just bored and wanted to do something more active and more, you know, involved. And I, I remember when she first started, she was like, oh my gosh, what have I signed up for? I don't know that I can do this. And now she's completed the program already. And we're like, look, see, you could do it just like anyone else can do it. And, you know, she's super proud of herself. She's a great worker. You know, we have all these stories. I mean, we could probably write a story about every person that we've hired through the apprentice program and why they came to us and what has changed for them because they made it through and now has, you know, we talk about it's not a job, it's a career, right? Because we want these people to be fully engaged. I mentioned the individual who's on our emergency response team. I mean, we we encourage them to join our groups, our employee resource groups, our emergency response team, be active in our safety. You know, we really want them to feel like we're a family here. And so we are looking for it to be their career, not just, hey, here's a stepping stone for one or two years. Yeah. So when they're first coming in and you're like to look at your hiring process, do so you actually have an entry point that falls under that apprentice model? So you you are coming in, not necessarily for a standard job posting, but hey, we have a pathway through this apprenticeship. So that's how you enter based on not having previous manufacturing experience. And that's sort of right. a, it's almost like really formal onboarding that happens for a long period of time, right? I mean, yeah. how, cause how yeah. long is the apprenticeship program for someone who's like starts the cohort? Is it just for the length of the cohort? And then at that point they transition and continue to work in the facility. Are they still doing any other training related to that apprenticeship or how does that work? Yeah. So the way it's set up, it is one, it's like I said, it's one year. Um, mm -hmm. Now they will come on board and do the exact same onboarding as any other employee. So we have mm -hmm. a three day onboard or three days um, in class. The fourth day will be forklift training. We do that with all of our apprentices as well. So they will actually start. Usually we'll start here at least a week before apprentice starts so they can do that. And then we'll start the apprentice class. Um, they're only going to the classroom one day a week. Usually all those classes are related to what we're doing. So yesterday, for example, in the afternoon, they were going to start talking about chemistry and some of the chemistry related issues. A couple of weeks ago when I was in the class, um, they were talking about scrubbers and what a scrubber was and how a scrubber works and why a scrubber is important. That is something that we don't do in that kind of detail with our other employees. So we've actually talked about at some point in the future We'd love for all of our employees to be hired in some kind of an apprentice format only because these guys are getting a more in-depth introduction to a pump, a valve, a scrubber, a, you know, whatever, safety. You know, they, they're they just getting a lot more basis. So even if you had manufacturing experience, there's still a benefit to going through this detailed kind of thing. Um, so 
it, so they'll do that. They go to school, like I said, once a week, they have projects they have to do presentations. So we're also trying to develop them. Um, us as leaders, we all have to go and speak to every single class. So, and we all have our own topics. I usually talk about leadership um, as a site leader, but I'll have, you know, an engineer that will go in and talk about safety and they will show them some of our own really bad safety incidents as an example and show what went wrong. What did we do wrong? Why did that happen? Why can't it happen again? Right. Because we're not trying to scare people. We're trying to explain what the controls are and why those controls are important. We always say our site is hazardous. It's not dangerous. It's hazardous. But that those to keep it from becoming dangerous, we have to follow procedures. We have to follow the controls, et cetera. Um, you know, we'll have somebody go in and talk through each of the processes. So, and that's coming from an engineer who works in that area. So we're always trying to make sure they're hearing it from our mouse, right? So even though they spend time with the instructor that we've hired, there is usually every week somebody, a guest speaker, I would say for two hours, right? Who's coming to share something about the site that also gets them introduced to us, right? So, you know, they all meet the site leader probably sooner than any other operator does because they get to see me. Um, we're trying to create the relationships. We want them to know who the leadership team is. We want them to know who the engineers are. We want them to know if they have an issue, who they need to go and talk to. Um, so they really are getting just such a broader onboarding experience, like you mentioned. You know, it probably you probably could say it's a one-year onboarding versus the other folks. But then, for example, that day that they talked about scrubbers, the next day they took a field trip at the site to go see a scrubber and really see one of our scrubbers in action. So we're also trying to link those two together in terms of the classroom training and the practical. They themselves have been doing tours for each other. So we're like, okay, today you're gonna go visit our um, electric art furnace and the apprentice who works in the electric art furnace is the one doing the tour for his cohort. So also kind of creating that you need to be presenting, right? You need to, and actually we have a lot of visitors who wanna meet our apprentices. So sometimes they're helping us do our tours. So it's important that they get used to doing that. Um, so I think it's just been really good. As far as when they're done, we haven't really done anything post apprenticeship, I guess. I, I would argue they're probably still getting together socially because I think, you know, they create that relationship. But it certainly is something we've talked about now that we're about to finish our third cohort. What do we need to do or what how can we incorporate them into the future? Right. Because now I think we have enough mass of people that we yeah. can look at. Is there an, an opportunity whether they could teach, right, be some of those guest speakers or how do we bring them in? Um, we've talked in the past, do we wanna do like a buddy system? So you have a buddy who's your mentor coach while you first start, I don't know. But I think there's, that's something maybe in a year if we talked again, we could say, this is what we've actually done. Cause now that we have enough classes that have graduated, um, they can come back and support future classes. Yeah, I, I really, I mean, it's just, what's so compelling about that is if I think of some of the things that we hear from industry and I mean, you can read it in any, any article when you talk about, you know, trying to hire people in and create a pipeline of talent. You know, some of the challenges is, you know, a lot of times where, you know, we're bringing people in, we're, we're taking them straight to the job and trying to kind of do things as quickly as possible. But to, to that point, it's very narrow in scope. So a lot of times you lose your sense of what your role is in relation to the entire business unit mm -hmm. or the entire site. And so you don't feel like you have a sense of, you know, what impact do I have? What else goes on around me? You don't get a lot of that context. You guys are taking a lot of extra effort through this process to, you know, like you said, just understand the operating systems within the plant. Why is that important? Scrubber, scrubber goes down. Like, why is that bad? You know, right. it, and, but a lot of people don't know that that wouldn't be a conversation they had because it would be, this is really narrowly specific to the activities you do daily versus understanding the full ecosystem around mm -hmm. you. And then also what I really like about this though, is there's always that if you don't build really good relationships with your coworkers, it's really hard for you to want to stay somewhere. And I don't know if we have a ton of opportunities day in, day out to really build those relationships, but it sounds like your cohort is creating that, which is a really awesome thing because a lot of people, that's why they leave is I don't feel connected to my peers. I don't feel like I really have a place here. I, you know, you don't have that, like I always say, a work best friend. You need to have a work mm -hmm. best friend not having that can make you feel extremely disconnected. So I think that's amazing that that's kind of, kind of coming as a product of all of this. I think it's a, a great way to look at that. 
Yeah, look, I, I think it's been interesting because I mentioned like, you know, we'll have a stay at home mom who's come back and, you know, we'll have a kid who's just graduating from high school. So I almost feel like they create that little family, like there's the mom figure and there's the ones that are young and need um, to be moved around and stuff. And, but they do take care of each other. They support each other. I mean, I can tell you, um, we had one from cohort two, her house burned down, she lost everything. And her group just like, came around her and like, hey, this, she needs this and hey, she needs that. And, you know, and then told us that, hey, she needs this, right? And and really also in some cases, they're advocating for each other, to be honest, because they feel comfortable talking to each other and maybe only one person feels comfortable speaking up. So they really are doing that. And because like, for example, they aren't afraid of me. A lot of people are like, oh, she's a site leader, right? <laughs> if I go out there right now and they have an issue, they'll be like, oh, I need this, blah, 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 blah. And they're not afraid to talk to me. They're not afraid to raise issues. They're not afraid to be open. Um, you know, I was just in there last week for, you know, talking about some of the results of our employee engagement survey and asking them for feedback because I knew they wouldn't resist, right? They would be honest about <laughs> it. Um, so it's, you know, it, that to me has been the biggest benefit that we did not even think about, right? I never thought about, oh, we're going to create this like mini family because of the cohort and that's going to make them stronger and more successful and more um, vocal. I just didn't even think of it. I, it just literally wasn't part of the, that's a benefit. No, and it's been, so it's been welcoming and always depends on the mix, right? Because you got to wait till they get there and then see how, you know, it, it's interesting to go to a class the first month versus the last month, because you'll see how they've now created more of that relationship between them because they've gotten to know each other as well over the year versus the beginning when they're all like, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? You know, um, but it is fun to watch. I mean, I, I know, you know, this class specifically, they're about to finish. And I told them yesterday, I'm like, hey, I'll be back in two weeks for your final presentation and your party. I said, I'm looking forward to it. I said, I remember when you guys started, you know, because usually what happens is when we do their end, whatever the new cohort is, we'll get invited to that as their, you know, we want you to see that other group graduate. So a lot of times that's the first time I meet the new ones as well. Um, so and to now see the difference in my interaction with these guys now versus, you know, a year ago, it's just kind of fun as well. Um, it, it's I could speak on and on about the apprenticeship program and the benefits, side benefits, well, versus the, you know, the actual ones that we thought about. But I think, you know, for any company that's looking to do something like that, just do it. You know, it took a lot of work to get it started, but now it's just flowing um, and really providing the benefit that that we had hoped for, which is to tap into a totally untapped part of the work and people, workforce that's out there. Have you seen, I mean, from a, a retention standpoint, let's say with those those cohort members, I mean, have you seen strong retention from that? So once they're in and they've done that first year beyond that, I mean, again, in the time frame from when you started, I don't know if you have a lot of really good data points on that, but are you seeing that there's a little bit, like you said, more commitment and engagement to the job and with the site to a point that you're, you feel like it's a really good retention strategy. You're seeing that these might be people that stay with you for several years. I mean, what's your, what's your read at this point having done, you know, four active cohorts? Right. So I will say the active, so cohort four, no, three, sorry, um, has not lost anyone. So the other two cohorts lost people at the beginning, right? So we had people who just didn't finish it. Um, and so I had asked, I actually asked yesterday, I'm like, did you guys lose anyone? They're like, nope, this is who we started with and we're still here. I said, okay, cohort one has, was not, I would say successful. So we have, I want to say three of seven left. Um, they were the guinea pigs. I'll say that, <laughs> you know, and we knew that, right? We knew going in, you guys are first, we need feedback. We made significant changes from cohort one to cohort two. I think cohort two, outside of somebody leaving at the beginning, they're fully still here. Cohort three, like I said, no one has left, not even from the beginning. Um, and cohort four, again, they're only two months in, three months in. So, but again, you know, really not seeing that versus the direct hires. Yeah, direct hires, people are leaving day one, day five, day 20, day 60. You know, it's not the same, right? Now, right. I will say this, and we recognize that. It is not comfortable to work at our facility. We have high temperature processes and it's not air conditioned, right? So we also recognize that it is not the easiest place to work. And we know that we're competing with some other manufacturing sites that are indoors and air conditioned. Um, so we also try to pay um, the highest in this area. 
Um, we're at $23.50 an hour right now. Our apprentices are making $22.50 an hour, and that's your starting salary and goes up from there. Um, and we do that on purpose because we know it's a difficult environment. So we also recognize that some of our turnover is that, right? They they come here because they need a job and then they get something in an air-conditioned environment <laughs> or, or heated because in the winter it gets cold. Um, but we do recognize that once they make it past six months, they're more likely to stay. And certainly with the apprenticeship program, that's more likely because they have this one year. It There is a commitment, though. We do ask them to commit to staying after the program. I believe it's a two-year commitment. So because we have spent money on your um, schooling, right, and you have this educational portion that comes out of it, you are supposed to stay. Um, and to be honest, you know, that's also part of us saying get involved. Because like you said, right, you're creating this family. And the more likely you do that, the more likely um, they're going to stay. So I think all of those things lead to this. Um, you know, we have people that in the last year have bought houses now, so they're going to stay in this area, right? People who relocated and, and did the apprentice program and feel very comfortable here and want to stay. Um, their involvement in other groups, I think, also shows that message of they're going to stay. So I think for us, um, outside of the first group, we have seen significant um, improvements in retaining them. It's just, you know, we need more data to be able to say long haul, you know, for five years, 10 years, et cetera, does it really work? You know, it's still too young for us to know that. Right. When, the, when you did the first cohort and, and like you said, that was really just your pilot. That's the first time doing it. And then you learned so much from that, that the second one, you made improvements. What were some of the things that you guys gleaned from that first cohort that you say, you know, we probably need to change that or adjust based on feedback. Were there any sort of aha moments or feedback that you got that you're like, okay, it, if we adjust that, I think that'll solve that problem. Was there anything there that just really bubbled up that you guys were able to address going into cohort two? Yeah, I think the biggest thing I would say is the curriculum. I mean, we had gotten this curriculum from Texas. We had cut out anything that really wasn't relevant, but it was still very general. You know, it was like safety 101, this 101, right? It wasn't specific to us. And so they would be like, why are you teaching me that if we don't do that at the site? Um, right. So that's where year on year, and like I said, this year we added the field trip. So last year we added more specifics about the site. And then it was like, well, what if we could see it at the site too? So we added the field trips, right? <laughs> you know, so it's all, and every class has done something. I would say that the other thing was um, we now have a guy um, from our continuous improvement slash training team who is fully engaged with the apprentices. So he goes to every classroom. Um, so every classroom activity, he's there all day. Sometimes he's teaching, sometimes he's just sitting in the back. Um, but he's kind of been also, I would say, their liaison for anything. Hey, my paycheck doesn't look right. Hey, I don't know how to do this. Hey, you know, at the beginning, that general HR type stuff that always kind of gets in the way of a new hire. Um, but then throughout of, you know, um, for example, he told me that every class, beginning of class, he will cover every incident that's happened in the last week at the site to make sure, A, they're seeing the incidents, but understanding what it means and learning from them. All the people can see, have access to see the incidents, but no one's walking through them, you know, unless it's a major incident that everyone will hear about, right? So I thought that was really good. And they see it as an opportunity to then provide feedback. Like I'll get emails almost every week from this guy. He'll say, hey, I heard this today in the apprentice class. I just want to you know, let you know, or can you follow up? Or so they also kind of use them as a, as a communication tool. I think that's been a huge difference um, versus before they would only really see somebody on site every once in a while. There wasn't like this one person dedicated to them. Um, he's actively involved in the interviewing and hiring process as well. So making sure from the beginning that we're hiring the right people. And he's the one who actually goes in the classrooms at the schools, at the career fairs and talks up the program. So if you join us, you probably have seen him multiple times throughout the process. Um, but I think that helps because you do want to see one person and create a relationship with one person, right? Um, and I think, you know, that unfortunately is something that you lose at these big organizations. Big, you know, we did not have, for example, Insight HR three years ago when we started. So there was no one to talk to. Um, we do now, but it's still great to have this one person or one point of contact that you can say, I'm having this issue or I have this problem or I'm just good and I want to tell you I'm good. Um, so I think that would probably be the two things that really have made a difference. And, I, and I'll be honest, I'm waiting to see what the next curriculum changes because I do think that we have to keep modifying. Um, hopefully we get to a point where it's good and we only modify because we've made a change at the site. Um, but I think it, it's good that we're taking that feedback and modifying because otherwise it wouldn't be successful. It wouldn't keep making better and better employees. Yeah. 
I'm curious about the, so you, you've got the, the apprenticeship classroom curricula. When these new hires who don't have manufacturing experience are coming on site to, to work and, you know, cause you're saying they're in class once a week, right. When they're on site learning those jobs, you know, what is your approach there? Cause I think, and the reason I bring that up is, is simply there's this barrier, right. That if you, if, it's kind of it's, it's kind of like a joke for me because I, I think it was true for for management as well. It's like, well, how can I be a, a manager? Because you say I have to have management experience. Where am I going to get the management experience from? It's the same thing with a manufacturer. I don't have manufacturing experience, and you want me to come in with it. Well, where am I going to get it if nobody gives me a chance? Right. So, how 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 are you guys adapting to that on the kind of OJT side when they're there learning those jobs? Because what you do is, I mean, those are really dangerous processes, mm-hmm. right? Um, how are you guys tackling that? Because there's so many industry folks that I think are concerned about taking on people that don't have previous manufacturing experience. But when you look at all the generations coming in as well, and then to your point, someone who's coming from the military service, you know, where would they have gotten that from? (laughs) So how how are you kind of bridging that gap on the, on the hands-on training side at the facility to complement what you're teaching in the classroom? Yeah. So I think, you know, to be honest, first of all, we we are trying as much as possible to treat them the same, right? Because we don't want to make a differentiation. I will say the first year was hard because people are like, who are these apprentices and why are they coming in here? And we had people who were like, can I be an apprentice? And we're like, you're already here. You know, so it (laughs) was the first year was a little rough in that sense of there probably was a little bit of the us and them mentality throughout the site. People it was change and change is always scary. And people didn't know, like, are these people now, like, are these apprentices going to be my boss tomorrow? You know, like there was always this like thought process of there was something else going on in the background. So I think that also, you know, may have also contributed a little bit to the first year not being as successful. Um, But now, you know, people get it. They understand, okay, you're trying to get people from a different, so they, they know when they're training them, these people come with a different level of understanding. So it's a different training. To be honest, at this point, because of the people we do have from cohort one and cohort two, in some cases, they're doing the training. So they're now training cohort three and cohort four, because what we did do from the beginning is we spread them out throughout the facility. So every group um, works in the four or five different areas. There's at least one apprentice in the four or five different areas. We never wanted to put five apprentices in one department and have at it good luck because that's hard to manage. Um, Mm -hmm. But because of that, having done that, we do have ex-apprentices or finished apprentices in every department. So if we're putting a new apprentice there, that person can be trained by someone who just went through it, right? And who then understands the challenges of you don't have any background. You don't know what a chemical is or what an SDS is or, or, you know, basic safety, you know, and you're just starting like below everyone else because you've never had the experience. So you know, I think today that whole us versus them has gone away. It's just another different group. We need to um, not make assumptions that they know X, Y, or Z because they don't, you know, they didn't come through that. Now at this point for the group that's about to finish, yeah, you should know all that stuff by now. (laughs) Um, And to me, the biggest thing is, you know, they have progressed just as well. You really don't see oh, because they didn't have manufacturing. I mean, if anything, because they don't come with any preconceived ideas, you don't have to break habits that might have already existed. You're teaching them from zero what the BASF way is, right? While if they're coming from another company, you might have to say, no, we don't do that here. You need to do it this way, which is sometimes harder. Um, So it just, it it really is, you know, I think to me now it's great to have apprentices that are available to do training and that's the easiest way to do it. But we do try as much as possible to put them through the same paces, just understanding they may not have the background that somebody else does. Yeah. I was about to say, it's funny, you're talking about all the acronyms, the SDSs and all that. Yeah. We manufacturing people tend to be a bit, we, we try and be like an exclusive (laughs) club, right. You know, we, (laughs) But it's it, it's really true that I think we're and I, I had a conversation with someone earlier this week and it was that same thing of young professionals and the truth is is that when you look at the makeup of your workforce over time you're going to have so many people that don't have that previous industry experience and they're really going to start to you know overtake the number of people that do and so I mean how do you adapt to that and how do you start treating that as to your point an opportunity 
to let me teach you the right way and let me let me bring you in in a way that you know you're doing things right from the start and I'm not having to break poor habits or unteach you things you may have learned over time somewhere else. So there's it's an opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not yeah. a bad thing. Yep. So I'm I'm really curious. Just um, I know we you know we have to probably wrap things up here shortly, but um, I, there's so many manufacturers in my experience that they they hear about apprenticeship they um we, we try and explain to them you know again apprenticeship carolina is is a really outstanding program that we have here in south carolina not every state is the same so i, I know ours is outstanding but there's always those reservations and hesitations about doing it and i just don't know how to help them overcome that i mean is there any anything that you can you know, help them to understand a little bit better. Cause I think they look at that and they go, Oh, that's a, that's a lot of work. Um, and yeah. I just don't think we can do it. And I feel like they're missing out on such a wonderful opportunity, whether it's with their own incumbent workers or youth apprenticeships or some, some type of arrangement. There's so many options. I mean, any, any words of advice from your perspective, having gone through that whole process of building something out that you could offer to maybe alleviate some concerns they have? Look, I think the key at the end is going to be to create the right partnership and collaboration. So we were really, really lucky that when we started having these conversations with Tri-County, they were all in, you know, they are like, how, yes, how do we make it happen? Like, and it was a collaboration, like I said, it took about a year because it was curriculum development. It was, we need to hire a teacher. Um, we need to sort out all the funding with Apprenticeship Carolina and Apprenticeship Carolina held our hand through the whole process as well, right? Um, they were actually just out a few months ago with the Department of Labor. They came to visit us as part of their audit so that they could show an apprentice program in action, so to speak. Um, so, you know, I think that's the key. You can't do this by yourself and you can't do it if you don't have the right partners who are just as committed to making something happen. And Tri-County you know, part of their their mission here in this area is really to bring education to people who don't have it otherwise, right? Or who don't have opportunities. So we fit right into what they've been trying to do within this area as well. And so I think you really have to find that right partner. And I know that the technical college system is trying to do that right throughout um, throughout uh, South Carolina, because I know our facility in Spartanburg is working locally there, I think with Spartanburg Community College to kind of try to do the same thing, right? Um, right. But th that would probably be the, the one success factor that if we hadn't had, if we hadn't had that strong collaboration and working and, and, and I'll be honest, you know, Tri-County threw a lot of people at this thing in the beginning to get it going, right? I met a lot of different people throughout from administrators to curriculum folks to, you know, directors of, of different departments, really trying to make this thing come to life because they understood um, how important it was, not just to us, but to them as an offering that they could do it. And they like to talk it up with other companies because they want other companies to do it too. Um, and to show that, hey, we're here to create a custom um, class for what you want and what you need. Um, so I think that that would probably be the key. I don't think you can just do this because you say, I want to do it. You've got to find the right people to do it with you or the right people with experience, right? So I guess you could probably find somebody out there and no man's land, right, that has maybe done this before that can join your team and help it. Um, but if we hadn't had the right support from Tri-County and from Apprenticeship Carolina, it would not have been a success and, and certainly just would not have gotten off the ground. And, and like I said, the, the opportunity to change it over time as well. Yeah, the fact that it's dynamic, I think there's a, there is concern anytime that you do anything that it's like it's fixed, right? It doesn't and, get stagnant. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. you're thinking, oh, I can't change it now. Now I'm stuck with this. But I mean, that's not how the manufacturing world works for sure. Yeah. So <laughs> it's nice to know that that's, <laughs> that's dynamic. You've got to yeah. be highly adaptable. <laughs> right? Absolutely. Yeah. But um, I think that's, that's also good advice because I do think there is probably a perception. It's a you've done something and then that's all you can work with. And you guys have that opportunity to use continuous improvement and make those changes to curricula as you learn things. And so people need to understand it. It is a flexible to adjust to what your needs actually are. I just think it's one of those things that we talk about, about a lot in, in try and promote as much as possible to the manufacturing industry ourselves, because we see the value proposition of it, but it's the taking that next step to actually do it and start those conversations a lot of times doesn't happen. And I'm, I'm not sure if it's just thinking that they're going to have to, you know, sort of carry that torch on their own or what the issue is. So I, I appreciate you kind of 
helping them to understand that if they're listening, that there's, it's more of, it takes a village, right? You have to find the right partners and really get everybody involved. It's not something you can do as a personal crusade on your own. So I think that's really helpful. Um, And I, and I think just, sorry to interrupt, but funding, I mean, I promise Carolina provides you with funding. So it doesn't cover a hundred percent of our costs, but it does cover significant amount that allows this to be um, financially feasible. And that's the other, sometimes that's the barrier that people think about is it's going to cost too much. Well, there is funding out there. You just need to connect with the right partners. Absolutely. I mean, South Carolina is so resource rich in in comparison to some other states. I mean, there's so many opportunities for people to invest in workforce development, you know, incumbent workers, new workers. There's just so many programs. Um, But yeah, that's that's a good point, too, is, is there is financial offset for that. So there's so many opportunities to engage with. Um, Apprenticeship Carolina. And I can um, add a link to that too in our episode notes as well, because some folks may not be familiar with that program, but I appreciate that. Um, So Elba, I guess to close out, do you have one success story that you really want to share on maybe someone who was, um, I would say, non-traditional in the sense they didn't have manufacturing experience that you're just like, I just love this story about this one apprentice. Is there anything that you want to share there that you can? Um, so I think I mentioned it. It was the the stay at home mom because she actually shared yesterday. I did not know this. She said her husband had actually come home and asked their son, "Hey, do you want to join the apprentice program?" And he had said, "No, I'm not interested." And she said, well, "What about me?" You know. <laughs> <laughs> and so I guess I thought that was a she. I've I've never heard that. She told me that yesterday because I asked her to share her story with the people that had I had brought to the class. And I thought that was really, really cool because obviously her as a mom and as a woman didn't see that as a barrier of, oh, it can only be for my son, right? She right away spoke up. Um, you know, she did something different. She did share yesterday that before they had moved here, she had been doing um, banking and financial so office work as well. So it's not like she'd stayed home forever, but certainly had a different career. Um, and when I talk to her now, I mean, I saw her out on the plant floor earlier this week and I was like, how's it going? And what are you doing? She's actually in probably the area that people don't like to work in. It's the hottest area of the plant. She's been in there all year. She's happy. She wants to stay there, you know? So again, it's always good to hear that, but it's it's fun to see how she challenged her own family members of, Hey, you could ask me if I want to do that. So again, it's that whole, we're looking to diversify our workforce. Sometimes we have to remind our family members that diversity exists as well. Right. (laughs) Um, But she's great. I mean, she's, she does a great job. She she engages. She, she's actually much more vocal. She used to be very, very quiet at the beginning, very shy, introverted. Now she, you know, so also I've seen her change in terms of her personality and comfort level um, over the year of her being with us. So it's just fun to see that as well. And like I said, I thought that was a cute story when she shared it yesterday of kind of like pushing her own family of, hey, I'm here. I can do this too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I, that just goes to show you though, like manufacturing is for anybody. Right. I mean, really, there's no, I mean, a lot of those barriers really have more to do with your own perceptions or, you know, maybe other people kind of influencing your perceptions that that's not possible, but really it is for anybody, anybody who's willing to really engage and give it a try. So that's, that's a really awesome story. I love that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Elba, I wanted to just wrap up and say thank you so much for sharing your story and talking about what BASF is doing. I think it's really good for the listeners who are also in manufacturing and looking at those opportunities. So thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. As I said earlier, I really enjoy talking about the apprenticeship program. And I think it's such an opportunity for any company that's willing to take the time and the effort. You're going to get the reward. Thanks for listening to this episode of the six M's of manufacturing podcast. Sincere thanks to Elba Lazardi for sharing her perspective on BASF's apprenticeship program and how it continues to evolve through each cohort. Visit the episode notes for details and reference links to information shared during today's discussion. Did you enjoy this episode? That's awesome. Be sure to follow our podcast and share with your network. And remember, don't just make it, make it better.